All right, uh, so this is uh, the first uh, video on NMR spectroscopy, nuclear magnetic resonance. So that's NMR, and you have to indicate which nucleus you're, you're talking about. So this will be a proton NMR uh, spectrum. We'll also encounter carbon-13 NMR uh, in this class. There are a lot of other nuclei that you can look at. You can look at fluorine. Fluorine has a, a, a magnetically active nucleus, nitrogen, sulfur. So anyway, we're gonna focus on proton and carbon. Uh, and, and really, proton NMR is probably the single most useful spectroscopy to the organic chemist uh, that's around today. So if you're, a, if you're a working organic chemist, you're gonna take a lot of proton NMR. You'll take a little less carbon NMR. You'll take some, you'll take a lot, but not as much as proton. Uh, and not as much, and, and you'll take a lot more of these than you will uh, IR. So anyway, as I did on the IR spectroscopy, I just want to go over some the, the regions that you should know uh, in these uh, in these spectra. So again, you're going to have intensity plotted versus energy. Down here on the x-axis, we're going to have something called chemical chemical shift, given in parts per million chemical shift from TMS. So this is called chemical shift. There's a few uh, terms you should know. So to the right, so actually TMS, which is silicon, right? TMS is tetramethyl silane, four methyl groups on silicon. All of those protons are chemically equivalent and they all come at, in this, because they're the standard, they come at zero chemical shift. So they come exactly where they come, right? As you get closer to zero, which is to the left, no, oh, sorry, to the right, as you get closer to zero, to zero, which is the right of the spectrum, we call that upfield. As you go to the left, bigger numbers, we call this downfield. You'll hear me use those terms a little bit. Okay, so basically what happens, and again, we'll talk about this in the class, you can read it in the textbook. Depending on the electronic environment uh, around a proton, they'll show up in different places in the spectrum. So to, to obtain this spectrum, we're applying a magnetic field. The, the magnetically active nuclei then either line up with the field, they, well, they line up with the field, and then the field they experience is the field you apply plus whatever magnetic field comes from the electrons around them. And so if you have a bunch of electrons around, around a, a proton, so functional groups with a lot of electrons, then that tends to shield the proton in question from the external field and it moves upfield. If you don't have much electron density around a proton, so you have a lot of electron withdrawing groups around that proton, that tends to expose the, the protons to more of the external field and they tend to shift, shift downfield. So where, where do things come? And so typically, fortunately really, sort of like for the uh, And again, this is proton NMR. So every, the only signals we're gonna see in the spectrum will be from protons. You'll never see a carbon directly or an oxygen or a nitrogen. So carboxylic acid protons tend to come from about 10 to 12. And they tend to be very broad. Aldehyde protons, so that is a proton bonded to, directly to a carbonyl uh, tends to come from about 9 to 10 and be sharp. All right. And then from about 6.5 to 8.5 come protons bonded to benzene rings, aromatic molecules. From about 5 to seven come non-aromatic, non-benzene-like protons bonded to uh, sp2 carbons. From about three and a half to five, you have sp3 this takes some explaining. So again, we're looking at the proton in question 
this proton will be bonded to an sp3 carbon that's bonded to an electronegative element. So something like uh, protons on a carbon bonded to chlorine or protons on a carbon bonded to oxygen would come three and a half to five-ish. And then we have from about two to maybe three in a bit, we have protons on an sp3 carbon that's bonded to an sp2 carbon. How's that for convoluted? So this proton is bonded to an sp3 carbon, but that sp3 carbon is bonded to an sp2 carbon. All right, and then finally, way down here, from about one and a half to zero, we have just your sort of generic sp3 carbons, or protons on sp3 carbons. So again, you're not seeing the carbons, you're seeing the protons. And so this proton's just bonded to an sp3 carbon that's bonded to other sp3 carbons, just sort of alkane-ish kind of, kind of functionality. So you'll usually see a lot of peaks down here. Okay. So one other thing to keep in mind, uh, at anywhere in any of these groups, a CH tends to have, so a CH, and again, you have to have a proton to see it, but a CH will tend to be downfield of a CH2, which tends to be downfield of a CH3, all else being equal. All right, so uh, this table is actually encapsulated a little better, I think, than the IR table. Table 16.2 on page 749. Uh, but again, the numbers are way too precise. The molecules are way too precise. I highly recommend uh, hitting pause, scribbling this down, uh, and trying to commit these regions generally to memory. And again, don't try to, you know, put too much stock into where in the region things come. That will tell you a little bit. It is a little bit additive. But mostly, uh, you want to have broad regions learned and have the, have the reasons for the trends. Again, the more electron withdrawing stuff, the more electron density you pull away from a proton, the farther to downfield to the left it will appear. The more electron density you push toward a proton, the farther upfield it will appear. All right, there you go.